Hi, my name is Chris Bergen. I'm president and publisher of Tax Analyst. I have the pleasure and honor to have with me Lawrence Gibbs, former IRS commissioner, and now with Miller and Chevalier, the law firm. And we're going to have a conversation about the state of the IRS and the fiscal state of our nation in general. Larry, thank you for doing this. Uh, I wanted to start with uh, you received the uh, ABA Tax Section's Distinguished Service Award a few weeks ago, which I think is totally worthy. Thank you. You, you made a speech that I've been doing tax a long time, you've obviously been doing tax longer than I have, that literally stirred me. And I, I read it as a, or heard it as a call to arms. I think the IRS as an agency is in trouble. I think some people are celebrating that because they don't understand how important the IRS is to the country. And if we keep going down this road, I think we could lose our fiscal system. And I wanted you to comment on that and maybe bring some of your elements of your speech here. I think it's, it's easy to overreact uh, as a former commissioner. And I recognize that. I recognize that some people may listen to what I or others have to say about the seriousness of our potential problems in tax administration and think that we're really overstating the problem. Um, I am concerned about our tax administration system. The importance of the tax administration system is really underlined by the fact that I believe our, our as a country, uh, our fiscal challenges right now are such that we're spending more money than we're taking in. And the IRS deals with what we're taking in. And since we're spending more than we're taking in, it's really important that we continue to have a tax system that operates effectively and efficiently in terms of getting the money in. Because if we lose that at a time that we're spending as much as we're spending right now, then it could have a serious impact uh, for our, our country. And it's a system that's kind of built on confidence. Um, I think the last Roper survey they did, um, if I remember the survey correctly, 12% of the people surveyed said they'd either cheat on their taxes or think about cheating on their taxes. If you flip that upside down, that means 88% of us, which is an astounding number to me, are trying to comply with the law, with a law that's basically voluntary compliance or self-assessment. If, if they lose trust in that system, if they lose trust in the administration of that system, what, the whole thing could collapse. Well, a lot of people think, look, it's not really a voluntary system because withholding takes place whether I want it to take place. My paycheck gets reduced. That money's taken out before I ever get my paycheck. Um, I have to make estimated payments. If I don't make estimated payments, I'm going to be penalized. The federal government is going to come get me. I happen to believe that taxpayers' trust, confidence, and so forth is very, very important because I've seen certain times when taxpayers have felt that the system is just not treating them fairly to the point that they look at it perhaps right now and say, well, wait a minute, I'm trying to comply. I'm calling the Internal Revenue Service. I can't even get through to the Internal Revenue Service to get help on what I'm trying to do to prepare my tax return properly. Meantime, I read about people that are trying not to comply, people that are going to these commercial preparers, and they're getting refunds they don't deserve, and they're keeping the money and they're not getting caught. So what's the point of me trying to comply when I can't get through to the IRS and get the help that I need when I've got so many people that I'm hearing about that are trying not to comply, and it seems to me they're getting by with it. And then the next thing I read is that all these large corporations and wealthy individuals don't pay tax anyway. Well, I can't afford the kind of tax help that they're getting from their big accountant firms and their big law firms. I don't think that's, I don't think that's a, an attitude that is totally far out. And the point is that if something like that gets started, then what you're going to find is that people have ways of gaming the tax system. And at, not, and at the same time, not all they're doing is sort of getting what they think they, ought to, that they deserve. They're not trying to, to steal anything. They think they're just doing what they need to do to basically get their fair share that everybody else is getting anyway. That is an attitude that if it gets started, 
can be very, very difficult for the Internal Revenue Service because it does not have the staff, it does not have the capability to enforce the tax law if people are not willing, for the most part, to voluntarily comply. Now, we're not, we're not to that point yet, but I think that we are getting closer than I would like us to see as a country in terms of the potential impact of that coming about. And you have a perspective there because more than anybody that I know, and I know a lot of people in the tax community, you've actually seen it almost happen. You become commissioner in 1986 after a disastrous filing season in 1985, um, well publicized, in which people were actually not getting their refunds. And while I try to advise people to keep their, to minimize their refunds, most people I know expect that thousand dollar check after they file. If you don't get the money, that's a clear way to kill confidence in the system. So you know what it looks like. Well, not a, actually while I was commissioner and talking to other commissioners around the world, our system was really the envy of the world because our system works and it has worked historically, it's worked year after year after year. And a lot of tax systems don't work that way. For example, in, in many tax systems, they only pay refunds as long as the government has the money to pay the refunds. Well, in that kind of a system, you're going to find that taxpayers really don't uh, rely on refunds. And therefore, the amount of money that taxpayers are paying in a year before they actually owe the tax in that kind of a system goes down. We could not afford that in, in our system. We have a system where taxpayers literally overpay their taxes, and it's not $1,000 now, it's up closer to $3,000 on the average, average, for 88 million taxpayers at the present time. That's a lot of money. These are people that have paid that money in almost a year or up to a year before the tax was actually due. They don't get any interest on that money. So that's really an interest-free loan from the public to the government to finance the operations of the government. That's significant. And if the administrator of that system becomes completely dysfunctional, the whole thing falls apart. If people lose confidence in the system itself and the people that are working in the system to treat them fairly, um, to effectively and efficiently uh, manage the system so that when people don't pay their fair share, they're made to pay their fair share. They're caught and forced to pay their fair share. And so that when people are trying to comply and have questions. They can get through to the IRS and ask their questions and get answers. When that doesn't happen, then the risk you run is that people begin to lose confidence in the effectiveness and the efficiency of the IRS. And when you see other agencies like uh, Health and Human Services and Veterans Administrations, where the public again is being confronted with agencies that are not working the way they ought to work. I'm just saying that it's, it's, a, it's a situation that is a precarious situation, in my opinion. And so we're at a point here in the history of the Internal Revenue Service where more often than not you see articles in the newspapers that put IRS and scandal, those two words very close together. You have an agency that is having its budget cut, and the reaction of a lot of people is, well, they do stupid Star Trek videos, so they don't deserve any money. Uh, a dwindling workforce, certainly a knowledge base inside the Internal Revenue Service that's dwindling as well, and you're asking an agency to do more and more and more not related to collecting taxes. That's your correct. income tax credit, now the ACA. Why do we expect this is going to work? Uh, because it's worked in the past. I think people have taken for granted that the IRS and our tax system are going to work. And I'll say this, mistakes are made. IRS is not totally blameless in this type of situations. Mistakes were made in terms of the Star Trek video, the, the, the expenditure of funds, that type of thing. So the agency has to be held accountable. But if they're held accountable in a way that affects their ability to operate effectively and efficiently, even if they do the things that they ought to be doing, then it seems to me it's a potential problem in terms of our entire fiscal situation. And we're talking about an agency that has been basically scandal-free for decades. I mean, yes, it makes mistakes, but there has never been the biggest scandal, if you want to use that word, and I'm making quotation marks with my fingers, 
was in the 85 filing season, and that was just incompetence. Well, the biggest scandal, I think, at the IRS actually goes back to the 1950s when you had political appointees that were given pa political patronage jobs for electing uh, a president. And then they were given jobs at the IRS to be deputy collectors all across the country. And in the 1950s, many of them went to jail for embezzlement. And you had a situation where an IRS commissioner went to jail for not reporting income. And you had a situation where an IRS attorney that was in charge of all of the IRS attorney's office had to resign because of allegations that the person was accepting things like cars and air conditioners and things of that nature. Now, that is a scandal. I mean, that is a real scandal. People can understand that. And uh, one of the first uh, interviews for the new commissioner that came in after the IRS was reorganized, after it became a career civil service organization, was a man from Dallas by the name of John Dunlap. And the first question he got asked by U.S. News and World's Reporter, in effect, was, Commissioner, do you think the American public can ever trust the IRS again? Well, and then it went downhill from there. That's, that's a scandal. That's a real scandal. Uh, there have been other events that have occurred. The IRS has recovered from them, but it takes a lot of work by a lot of people on a day-by-day -day basis to re-earn the trust, the confidence, and ultimately the, the respect from the American public. But if you look at it from a different point of view, this is an agency that is basically very functional has been for more than 50 years, does a wonderful job at what it was designed to do, collect taxes. It's filled with dedicated public servants. I know a lot of them. I understand the IRS is an agency that everybody loves to hate, but I don't think the average American taxpayer understands your point that this is actually an efficient system. This is a well-run machine most of the time by dedicated, hardworking government servants. Oh, that's supposed to be a dirty word now, too. Um, I think it is being taken for granted, and for some people who want to see the IRS go away, isn't it a little bit be careful what you wish for? Well, one of the, the examples that I give, and it's been true, I've been involved uh, in the tax system for about 50 years, and I've been to the IRS twice now, once in the 70s and once in the 80s. Um, what's happened over the last, I'd say, 40 years is that the IRS has been effective to the point that when our politicians have programs that they want them to administer, they keep giving them to the Internal Revenue Service. So it's, there's a lot of criticism uh, that's thrown the IRS away, but the truth is that it is an organization that in the past has been able to perform sufficiently well that more and more of not only revenue collection programs, but now spending programs uh, government assistance programs, uh, the earned income tax credit to provide welfare benefits, the ACA to provide health care benefits, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. There are a number of other programs are being run through the Internal Revenue Service, but at the same time, the resources haven't been provided to administer these programs. And as a result, the IRS is having more and more to do with fewer and fewer resources. Their resources have absolutely been cut for three years straight now. The National Taxpayer Advocate says that training at the IRS has been cut by more than 80 percent. Correct. I, how do you run an agency where you don't train its people to do what they need to learn? I can't imagine how you do it. Uh, at least in uh, our law firm, I think in most private sector uh, tax organizations, uh, training is absolutely key. The law changes uh, almost daily. It gets more and more complex as our society gets more and more complex. And the idea of cutting training funding by that much over that many years, uh, you're going to have problems. I'll just tell you, you are going to have problems at the Internal Revenue Service if you do those kinds of things. Would you mind talking a little bit about the new IRS commissioner? I know you've met with him. I've seen him only speak once or twice. Very impressive to me. Uh, can you kind of explain what kind of commissioner you think he's going to be and what he needs to do the kind of job that you did? John Koskinen is a very impressive person. I've had the uh, pleasure and the opportunity to uh, sit down with him, um, talk to him about the uh, issues that are at the IRS today, the challenges he faces, how he's going to approach them, that type of thing. Um, I think he's absolutely come with a track record both in the public sector 
and in the private sector. He's seen the government for, uh, in a variety of different uh, positions, major positions, uh, key positions at the Office of Management and Budget, uh, key positions at uh, Freddie Mac. His specialty in the public and private sector in the past has been dealing with troubled organizations and turning them around. Uh, I happen to believe he's the right person in the right time for the job. And I think one of the things that he brings to uh, the Internal Revenue Service is both a respect for the organization and for its employees, but also a dedication to the public to turn the IRS around, to basically restore the public's respect and confidence, and if they really do a good job, in some cases, trust. Uh, and that, that's the right message at the right time. I also think he's willing to really deal with the hard problems. He has said from the get-go, from the time that he was actually uh, uh, at his hearing to be confirmed, before he was actually appointed, by uh, confirmed by the Congress, that he felt there had to be more resources devoted to the IRS and that those resources, he said, had to be uh, handled effectively and efficiently by the Internal Revenue Service. But he's hammering on that and he's continuing. He's a bulldog. He's not going to give up. And I frankly think that's the right message. When you came in in 86, um, how were you received by lawmakers in Congress? The IRS clearly had, had a bad filing season. Um, I believe it was on a, a, you, you were in in August. In October 22, 1986, I believe that's the right date, President Ronald Reagan signs the Tax Reform Act of 1986, the likes of which, which most of us had never seen that you had to administer. What was the reaction you got from Capitol Hill? Very interesting because clearly most people think, particularly people in the tax area, but even uh, the media now, uh, when I tell them that I was commissioner from 86 to 89, immediately people say, oh, well, you were there when the last major tax reform act was, was enacted. That was, that was what you were doing. And the answer is, no, that's not what I was doing. That, I, I had to play a part in that. I had to be involved in it. But the message I got from both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue, both from the administration and the Congress, was that my number one job was to see that the problems that existed in the 1985 filing season, when the IRS couldn't process re tax returns, pay refunds to 85 million people, could not begin examinations collection, to, could not continue to operate the organization, to see that that never happened again. That was my number one job. And that was the message that came through from the Congress on both sides of the aisle. They told me they were willing to help me. They told me they were willing within bounds to provide resources. Uh, they told me they were willing to uh, have flexibility in terms of how they appropriated money so that I could shift the, 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 the budget of the IRS to where I saw that it was needed. But they also told me I was going to be held accountable to see that that never happened again. And this is where I was going with that. Is the new IRS commissioner walking into that kind of environment on Capitol no. Hill? Because all, all you hear from certain segments of Capitol Hill is just nasty. I did not have to deal with a partisan Congress. Um, certainly there were, there were ideological differences. Um, Democrats, Republicans had their differences, no doubt about it. If I went down to see uh, uh, a member of one party then in charge of a committee, I went to see the, the member of the other party that was a ranking member of that. That was just something you did. So you paid very careful attention to the fact that there could be a perception if you were leaning one way or the other in terms of favoring one of the two parties. But in the final analysis, when problems arose, they found ways to come together on a bipartisan basis and get things done. I mean, imagine, they, they actually reformed our tax law, something we're trying to do now and just don't seem to have a way to do it. Well, it was done in 1986. They spoke to me in terms of what they were expecting of me with one voice. Different people had different areas of emphasis, but the message was basically the same. That's not what the present commissioner is facing. He just is not. And at the time that he is being asked to do more with the Affordable Care Act, uh, the Obamacare, and so forth, he's being given less and less money. 
and he's being told you're not going to get any more. And I'll tell you, that's, that's, I was given more money. I had problems, but I was given more money. I was given more flexibility. The American public has to be told, if you're not going to fund the federal government, then there are going to be problems. There just are. And the American public is really not being told that. That was not the message back at that time. The message back at that time was, if you run into problems, if you have difficulties, get to the bottom of what's causing them, fix them. But we'll help you. The help is not there, from, in my perception, from the Congress today. So the new commissioner is pretty hand-strong. Absolutely. One of my heroes uh, that was there when I was there the first time, Don Alexander, used to say, you know, he said, I, I came into the federal government, he said, I took this position as commissioner, and he said, you know, the pay is lousy, but at least you get to take a lot of abuse. <laughs> and he was a truly great man. Well, leads me to another other area. Um, you come into the Internal Revenue Service the first time around the same time Don was commissioner. Um, and I hope I'm not revealing a personal story here, but you talk about after you left in the early 70s, you were driving to Charlottesville, you looked in your rearview mirror, saw the Washington Monument, and said, I'm never coming back to this town. And then you came back. I mean, you went back to Texas, which I know you love, and when they asked you to be commissioner, you came back, and I think you said it was different when you came back. What was different? Things were much more positive back at that time, uh, the second time around. Um, first time around with the Nixon White House, um, the Nixon White House gave the IRS an enemies list and said these are the enemies of President Nixon, go audit them. Uh, the then Commissioner Johnny Walters was actually given a list of the President's enemies and told to audit the President's enemies. He talked to Secretary of the Treasury, then Secretary of the Treasury uh, George Shultz, and they decided to do nothing and put the list in a safe in the Deputy Commissioner's office. Uh, there wasn't any of that when I came back the second time. As a matter of fact, I asked uh, my boss, Jim Baker, Secretary of the Treasury, the second time around, if the White House had anything to communicate to the IRS, I suggested uh, the White House communicate it to his office, Jim Baker's office, and let Jim Baker decide uh, how to handle the communications. As a result, I never heard from the White House. Um, Jim thought it was a very, very good idea, and he told me, he said, I don't know whether you'll be commissioner, but I'm going to implement. That's a good idea, and we'll, that will be done. So it was an entirely different political atmosphere uh, at that time. It was also a much more upbeat uh, atmosphere because things were, were getting done. The 86, 1986 Tax Reform Act was passed. Uh, there was support for the IRS, and with it and with the cooperation of the employees within the Internal Revenue Service and an awful lot of hard work, uh, it was possible to earn the public's respect and confidence. Uh, totally different time from the 1970s with the Nixon administration. And I ask the question because that means we can change. We can Absolutely. get out of the current situation. Um, in, in the 1990s, the Senate held, I believe, two sets of hearings on the IRS, and they were a little scary. They almost looked like a mob trial. They had people behind screens, and there were terrible, horrible stories about jackbooted thugs, the Internal Revenue Service, uh, and horrible collection activities, most of which proved not to be true, most of, most of which tax analysts proved not to be true. Um, the end result was, in 1998, the Internal Revenue Service Restructuring Reform Act which redid a lot of what the IRS, how the IRS operated. In retrospect, do you think it worked, worked in certain areas but not in others, or actually probably hurt the IRS in the long run? Um, I think there were two different parts. The act that you're talking about was passed in 1998, and there were two different parts of, of the act. Uh, one uh, part was a taxpayer bill of rights where taxpayers were given certain rights. Some of that worked very well, some of it didn't. The other part of the IRS was to restructure the Internal Revenue Service away from the structure that had been added in the 1950s uh, with the Truman scandals um, to more of a specialized organization. I, I think that has worked up to a point but with the lack of resources that has come about recently, that type of organization, in my opinion, is not working as effectively 
as it did when resources were actually available to implement the concept. I think the concept's fine, but carrying it out has been difficult, particularly with the loss of resources. And one of the things behind the 1988, the 1998 Act, um, the way I look at it and often explain it is the IRS kind of lives on a pendulum that mostly Congress swings. Enforcement to taxpayer service enforcement. A lot of people argued in the late 90s that the IRS had gotten too far out of whack on the enforcement side. Um, maybe 98 pushed it a little too far to the service side. There is a balance there. The, the current national taxpayer advocate um, it's basically warning that the IRS is now headed back, that pendulum is headed back strongly to the enforcement size. She actually uses the word dehumanizing the taxpayer from the agency's standpoint. It's basically a number now because they don't have the resources to properly service taxpayers. Where do you think the pendulum is now? Uh, I look at it right now and say this. Um, again, I hate, to, I hate to harp on it, but the truth of the matter is that taxpayer service is not being funded. And as a result, the number of people that can actually get through to the Internal Revenue Service on the telephone during the filing season, that number is dropping. At the same time that is happening, you got a situation now with the international area, international tax area, becoming more and more important and the challenges that the IRS has there, plus the identity theft and refund fraud that is mounting, where people that are not necessarily trying to pay their fair share seem to be getting by with more and more. So I would say that it's not a question of whether one is working better than the other. Uh, there's a difficulty here. That pendulum does swing. The trick is to keep it within parameters. But I, I don't perceive that it's so badly out of whack on the enforcement side that you need to just give it a shove back the other way. I think it's more a matter of additional resources to try to help in both areas. And in addition, uh, there's no doubt, particularly with the rise of the international tax area, we do need tax reform. We do need tax reform in this country, and that's not happening right now. I want to ask you where, we're, where we're, this is going to end up and what it's going to take to end us there, but I want to ask you another quick question first, if I could. If somebody called me up tomorrow and said, I've just been asked by the White House to become the next IRS commissioner. Do you have any advice? This is the first piece of advice I'd give that person. Go take Larry Gibbs to lunch. What would you tell that person? What kind of advice would you give them? Well, I think this is, frankly, I think this is not a bad time to be the IRS commissioner. In Washington, D.C., it's all about can you exceed expectations. And frankly, the expectations are pretty low for the IRS today. So I think the next commissioner has a pretty good chance to be able to ex succeed by exceeding the, the expectations. Um, there are always going to be challenges for the Internal Revenue Service and for an IRS commissioner. There just are. Uh, as a result, um, I would tell him that my experience as commissioner the second time I was there was a great experience. It really was. The people in the IRS are largely dedicated and hardworking. It's a big organization, and with any big organization, you may have some problems. But by and large, the people in the Internal Revenue Service <clears throat> are capable and they, they work hard. Uh, that's, and I, as I've said, that's indicated by the fact that Congress keeps giving them more to, more to do. Uh, I think the present commissioner is on the right track. I do think more resources need to be given to the Internal Revenue Service. And, if the commissioner's not able to get those, then uh, it's not going to be as much fun as it was while I was there. And if you had to pick one area that probably a commissioner, I've heard you talk about this before, that probably a commissioner wouldn't think about coming in, one area to watch out for that's going to blindside you if you're not careful, what is that? Well, I know the answer to this one. The, the present commissioner knows what that area is. I have been in saying for the last 10, 15 years to commissioners that came in, watch out for the tax-exempt organizations area. And uh, the new commissioners usually look at me and say, you mean charities? And my reaction is, well, that's part of it. And of course, we saw over the last year that the tax-exempt area with the social welfare organizations. I mean, when the American public learns a code section like 501c4, which are social welfare organizations, you know there's a problem. Yeah, no, you just good. do. Uh, so I think the present commissioner really understands the challenges that are there in that area. But yes, I do believe 
that the tax exempt area, particularly the charitable, the political area, that are tax exempt areas, uh, they are among the more difficult ones that I've seen for the IRS to administer. Is it going to take a catastrophe to get us out of our fiscal situation and get the Internal Revenue Service out of its current state? I would hope not, but at least uh, the my friends on both sides of the aisle who are economists are saying that we've got a real problem. We're spending far more than we're taking in in revenue. It's a problem that uh, economists on both sides of the aisle say you can't tax your way out of, you can't take that 1% and tax them 100% and solve the problem. The politicians don't seem to be able to address how to deal with the problem. And so the economists that I've talked to, both sides of the aisle, Democrat and Republican, say what we're on is un the, the track that we're on, the place where we're going, spending as much as we're spending is unsustainable. And by that they mean yeah, it's probably going to take some sort of fiscal event, hopefully not as bad as Greece, but something in the way of a fiscal event that causes the American public to say, oh my gosh, and perhaps at that point come together to ask the politicians to do what we need to do to address it. Uh, I, my biggest concern, Chris, over that is I can't believe that we're going to leave to our children and our grandchildren that kind of a problem to deal with. Hope it won't happen during my lifetime, it may, but that's not a legacy that I want to leave. I would hope that the American public could basically come together to empower our politicians to deal with our spending, levels of spending, levels of taxation, and work this problem out so that we don't leave that for children and grandchildren. I think on that note, I want to thank you for being here. Thanks. Answering our questions. Thanks for having me. It's always fun.